Welcome, everybody. Today, we have an amazing special guest named Isha Erskine, who is our Platinum Sync Titan Award recipient for landing over 500 sync placements. In fact, Isha, you're up to uh, over 800 placements now. 800 now, yeah. That is awesome, man. I would love for you to share uh, your story from awareness about what licensing is and that it's actually an opportunity for independent musicians from that moment to where you've gotten to now with over 800 placements. You know, it's interesting because it actually starts a lot with you, Michael. Like I was at a point in my life where uh, I had little kids, so I was kind of with them during the day, but then at night I still wanted to work on music. And I was like, well, what could I do? I'm already making my own music for fun. How could I monetize this in some way? And I started to look into like stock audio and sync licensing. And I was kind of doing it kind of wrong at the beginning with some of these really like sort of devaluing cheap outlets like Pond5 or Audio Sparks. But then you were doing a free seminar about sync licensing. And I hopped on that and sort of started to get my ducks in a row a little bit more and get sort of the workflow of, okay, I need to really build my catalog and make better connections, get my music represented by exclusive music libraries that have regular clients on certain TV shows and things like that. And so I really just went nose to the grindstone and tried to write a hundred tracks a year for like five years straight. And, uh, you know, it's really not actually that hard because it's only like two or three tracks a week. And you get faster and faster at it. Um, One of the other things that I learned from you a little bit later, it's okay to use kind of the same sounds for multiple songs and have like albums instead of just like, oh, this song in this genre, this song in this genre. And that speeds up the workflow a ton too. Because if you're like, if I'm going to use this drum set on uh, 10 songs or, you know, it's all going to be ukulele based or something that's pre-mixes itself as you have your template just saves, you can crank out songs that way that was that was a big part of of my own process was figuring out the system yeah obviously you know we teach that in in sync placement academy how you can use various templates and whatnot to really speed up your process and be able to crank out a lot of music but you know the thing is when i say crank out a lot of music i don't want to overlook that and and make it seem like oh we're just blasting stuff out because that's that's not what it is at all you know uh, when you look at every successful say mix engineer there are a lot of tremendous mix engineers who mix the biggest songs in the world right and it doesn't matter who it is sending them the songs they have their mix template got your tools ready to go yeah Yeah, they know when they sit down this is what i use on the drums this is what i use on the vocals this is what i use on the guitars and whatnot uh different eqs different reverbs different delays it gets them where they want to go very quickly. And then the rest of the time is spent like on the minutia, you know, tweaking the little EQ thing, EQ elements and compression and just getting everything to sit together. But when you start with templates, you know, and, and then you're actually writing for an album, you know, I'm I'm going to use the same snare drum on the majority of this record. It, it speeds up all your time when it comes to mixing because you don't have to start over from scratch with every yeah, song. Absolutely. If you're doing an electronic music project, you could spend a lot of time like scrolling through bass synth sounds or snare samples. Like you could waste an entire hour choosing the right snare. Well, once you've done that, if you can use it for 10 songs, then it's going to go a lot quicker. With your placements, what would you say are the percentage, the percentage splits between vocal placements that you've had and instrumental placements that you've had? Oh, it's like 95% instrumental. And then like 5% vocal stuff. And some of those are vocal songs where the placement was the instrumental version. Uh, But a lot of it, at least 80% of it, is just purpose-built instrumental cues. What percentage of them would you say came through a sync agent versus a music library or a rep or somebody? I would say like 99% of it is through exclusive music libraries. And then there's like a small handful of placements that were like direct music supervisor contact what are you what are some of your favorite placements that you've had or ones that you're most proud of uh i got a michelob ultra advertisement and that was that was fun um and it had guitar in it i started as a guitar player so any song that has real instruments and guitar makes me happy because so much is like a large majority of my revenue is just like spooky underscore where you have some big boom and then floaty drones and stuff like that, which is under like a lot of news, Dateline and 
ABC 2020 and that kind of stuff. Yeah. You, that's a great, that's a great uh, thing to talk about because, you know, when people think of sync licensing, they immediately think of that big placement on a big show like Grey's Anatomy. Whereas when you really listen to TV, there's music on everything, all the ins and outs for the news shows and the news packages and whatnot. And that's tremendous revenue stream. Yeah. And that's been most of my revenue stream. Like I would love to get some bigger high dollar ad placements or like, I had some vocal songs that were sort of featured in a movie with like a dance scene and stuff like that. But the large majority of the revenue is just tons of small instrumental placements that add up. You got to follow the dream. I mean, follow the green, <laughs> follow the dream. That's what Mark Cuban says anyway. So if the money's coming in there, it's smart to lean into that. And, you know, it's obviously yeah. working for you. So I think that's that's awesome. As a little bit of your background, you said you started off as a guitar player, but also I know that you're very heavy, obviously, into engineering and production. What was your actual musical path that you took? Uh, I started as a guitar player and vocalist in a punk rock band and wanted to record my own music. And then I started recording all the local bands around, went to college for um, music composition. So I got all my like music theory chops, which have become super helpful with sync licensing when you're like trying to call on an emotion and you know like sort of what mode or scale to use um and then i went to a recording trade school called the conservatory of recording arts out in arizona they require you to do an internship to graduate so i went to los angeles and sort of did that typical engineer path where you get people coffee and scrub toilets and wrap cables and slowly work your up to assistant engineer where you set everything up and then you start actually recording and producing artists and so that path. And then I wanted to kind of get out of the city because it was really not where I wanted to be. And I moved north to have kids and have a farm and focus more on like sync licensing and independent artists. Yeah, I love the whole aspect of having the freedom, obviously, to live where you want. And like remote mixing, too. Like you can do that from anywhere. I've got kind of a, a fun question here. If you could collaborate with any artist, living or dead, if you co-write them or co-produce with them, who would it be? Paul McCartney. Wow. Ah, we've had a couple of answers with Paul McCartney. Yeah. I mean, so I had like three goals when I got into the music industry. It was get a Grammy, get a platinum record and work with a Beatle. And I got the first two and I did get a song that was placed in a John Lennon documentary. And I'll call that kind of working with the Beatles. But no, I would love to like be in the studio with Paul and even just like be an assistant engineer and like patch stuff in and hang out like anything. That would be amazing. What would you say a typical week looks like for you? Oh, it changes so much depending on who's booking the studio. But uh, I basically work like 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday. And it's a combination of clients coming here to record and write songs or people sending me files over the Internet to do mixes. If that sort of like what I call like quick now money slows down, and I have a day open, I'm like, well, then I'll write a track for one of my favorite music publishers. And they send me like briefs that I can just tailor to what they need. And uh, so that's how I like sort of fill my spare time when I'm not doing work for hire stuff. Really, the, the, the placements that we've seen come out of there, there's been a few that have come through, you know, pitches, but I'd say it's almost 50 50 on pitches and placements versus customs, the yeah. customs that come through those usually place they place about 70 percent of the time so if you ever see a custom come through and it's something you can crank out throw it on in there yeah it's just about the time like if i'm right. actually if it comes through on a day where i'm not busy doing something else it's like yeah i could write a track and of the course. vocal thing is trickier too because i'm not a singer so if i have to find someone to write you know an instrumental is something i can do in three hours and almost any genre it seems like but but a vocal thing is, you know, a vocal session. That's another three, four hours or whatever. Yeah. What advice would you have for artists inside Sync Titan community or thinking about getting into sync and joining a community like that? I mean, I think the most important piece is to, to just get started, start writing because, you know, your quality will go up as you practice. It will get to a point where it's actually at the same level as all your competitors. And then you'll be building your catalog as you go main thing is just like get started start building your catalog um and then definitely like listen to these guys about how to do your metadata correctly and get it to the right people 
I was reading it. I'm trying to remember what the quote was, and I wish I could go back and find it quickly, but uh, I'll give you the gist of it. And the gist of it was where they said that that the difference between like success and failure is it starts with right before action. It, it happens with, with people deciding whether they're going to take action or deciding whether they're not going to take action. And that becomes the primary determinant for whether you're going to move forward and succeed. And, and basically the quote was, how it doesn't necessarily have to do so much with the education or the knowledge or even the skill set. It has everything to do with that decision to take action. That's why my main advice is just get started. Because a lot of people come up with all these reasons why they're not getting started. And you need to really just put that aside and start making songs, you know? And like, yeah. I will say that if you can, f like the briefs in Sync Titan are amazing or any other publisher that like tells you really what they need can be helpful to get like a direction. But not everyone can write every genre. So another thing would be like, get good at what you're already somewhat good at, and then maybe start branching out to trying other things. We had talked previously, um, like we had talked a couple months ago, maybe a month or two ago, but you were talking about the struggle initially starting off when it came to licensing and starting to get those first couple placements, yet with the understanding that the payday is, you know, oftentimes, you know, nine months, 12 months down the road. So sometimes I try to bring like co-writers into my fold and they get overwhelmed or tired of the patience aspect of when is this actually going to feel profitable and worth my time? From my experience, like let's say the first year that I wrote 100 tracks, I saw no revenue whatsoever. They were getting into music libraries and they may have even been on TV, but I didn't know about it yet because it's like six months after it's been on TV they're required to file the cue sheet. Is that correct, Jody? You probably know more than me. It varies. There's no um, set date that I know of that we're required to file the cue sheet. There's some projects, you're talking about t TV series in particular, right? Yeah. Technically, it's by the time it airs, the PRO should have the cue sheet for the sake of the writers and publishers. It's very often that that doesn't happen because it might air, let's say there's a series that has 13 episodes, episode two airs, or let's say episode five airs, and they're still finishing up clearance and other things for episode two and episode three and episode four. Sometimes we're behind and playing catch up. So the reality is the cue sheets don't usually get submitted until several months after a TV show will air. I yeah. hadn't seen it where it was like six months, nine months later, the cue sheet gets submitted. It's usually earlier than that. I'd say anywhere from two to four months at the most. I noticed because there's an air date in ASCAP when the cue sheet shows up as new. Yeah. And a lot of times for like, at least for the TV shows that I've been working with, it is like six months. Well, it's, and it's, you bring up a good point because as you're in many cases, your own self-publisher, right? You're chasing down, checking in on cue sheets, chasing them down uh, to get them collected. And a good publisher will do that for you. A good publisher is following up I have a spreadsheet and I keep track of, have I received a confirmation? Have I issued my license? Have I received the cue sheet? Have I sent it to my admin? You've got yeah. to keep organized like that and keep track of it because somewhere along the way, someone could always drop the ball, whether it's the supervisor, the, sometimes the producer's responsible for submitting a cue sheet and they've never done that before. Yeah. The music coordinator might not do it in time. Your administrator might not reach out to collect it. So nobody's going to fight for that more than you. And that's why it's sort of a long process too. Yeah. So to sort of continue the story, it's like, here I am two years after writing now 200 tracks and I get my first royalty statement and it's $56. And I'm just, you feel defeated because you're like, I've put in so much time and effort. I don't know if this is really worth doing. Um, but thankfully it is because fast forward to now you know, I've had 800 placements and, you know, these things have aired on TV a bunch in the past. So I'm like sort of caught up and getting the regular flow of money now. So the fact that I'm still getting paid for work I did years ago is amazing. Um, it's like a retirement plan. And like that will even as these things continue reruns and re-airing, it'll go to my estate and I'll be able to pass those royalties on to my children. So I just think sync licensing is amazing. And it's really like the last vestige of uh, a way to make money in the music industry because CD sales and streaming are just such a small way to, or, you know, they, the return is so small.
Yeah, to to make any any significant amount of money from CD sales, you have to look at that as a full time job and just be pushing your songs and pushing those sales on a constant basis. Where with you, as you were sharing earlier, the typical week you're mostly working with clients. You know, yeah, and, I don't and have mixing. time to be a full time pitcher, which is also yeah. why I'm really happy that my music is represented by exclusive exclusive music libraries because they're working my catalog, even though I don't have time to be working my catalog. Let, let's let's talk about that for a moment. Finding an exclusive library to work for you. I think a, a lot of artists who start out, producers starting out, just getting into it, maybe even two years in, they're at that point you just mentioned where they're a little struggling, but they know they want to do this and they have that resilience and they just throw their music into any exclusive library that'll take them on. What are your thoughts about that? Like my journey with that was that I cast a bit of a wider net at the beginning. And then when I saw which companies were really working my catalog, I dedicated more time and energy for writing for them. So, you know, I do have some music that's sort of like locked away that is not really earning money. And that's something to be aware of. Maybe look out for exclusive in perpetuity deals, unless you're like so confident that they're really going to do well for you. You might want to try to make sure you have an end term so you can move your music out of that catalog if after a few years they don't earn you any revenue. Um, and then the other side of that is like, you know, finding a catalog that represents a style of music that you're good at. And, you know, a way to do that is sort of like just research, IMDb research, credit research at the end of a program who provided the music. It's really nice on ASCAP. Once you do get cue sheets, you can see, oh, what are all the other publishers that are getting music on the same show? Maybe I should consider submitting to them. So that's a really helpful resource. But these companies are really busy and their main goal is pitching the music that they already have as opposed to like looking for, I mean, they need new music. It's the second priority. Their main goal is providing music, <clears throat> excuse me, to their clients. So you will get a lot of non-responses. And so like be prepared that like if you submit to 20 companies, you might only hear back from three of them and two of those could be no's but at least you've got one. So that can be very discouraging, um, but I think it is worth the effort in the long run. When it came to you connecting with the companies that you work with, what was your big aha moment? Was it do the research that you did on the back end before you reached out to them? Was it getting on the phone and talking to them or having email conversations? What was for you the big uh, uh, game changer for connecting with those companies? Well, it was very helpful that in my like subject line, I can write like music from multi-platinum Grammy winning producer. That's helpful for me and not everybody can do that. I think it was also really helpful for me to, as I was writing those first hundred songs, they really did start to get better. And by year two, the songs got even better. So like you're, the music that you're making is better. Then you can create a new like updated reel of your best things. And some of the libraries that I was going for, instead of like being like, I have this album for you, I was trying to show them I'm very versatile. Look at all these different genres that I can do that work for your clients. And so sort of making a really good playlist of my best, my best work. So you were, you were approaching them with full albums worth of material. Um, no, I was approaching them with like a playlist of maybe my five best tracks in a variety of styles and saying like, I could write more for you in these genres if you would like. Yeah. But, but once you got in contact, once you actually had that conversation with them and they accepted your music, then you were delivering albums or were you just delivering songs? Uh, it was somewhat publisher dependent uh, a lot of times it was a song at a time but if there was like a deadline for like okay we are submitting to this tv show at the end of the month i would try to write as much as i can and using the templates that we talked about earlier i would try to do as many as i can and if i was able to get to like number 10 then we would like package it individually with its own album logo and that is always nice because I feel like when a music supervisor hears a song that really works and it's connected to some other songs, then they just start using a bunch. And I've had placements like that come along where one TV show uses like eight out of 10 songs on an album that I created and the placements just really start to add up, which is really nice. Yeah. Do you have any advice for collaborating and co-writing with others? Uh, it's definitely important to come to all your agreements about how you're going to split 
like the ownership, the back end royalties, and the workload of getting these tracks accomplished ahead of time so that everyone feels equitable about it. Because it's very easy to get into these situations when you're someone like me who can produce all the instruments and mix where you just feel like you end up doing everything. And that can be a little bit frustrating. So like finding how to share the workload so it seems worth your while. And sometimes that's just taking a bigger percentage. Um, and that can be tricky for people to be like, well, I'm giving you 70%. It's like, yeah, but you're doing this one part and I'm doing everything else. And also it gets back to what you were talking about earlier with vocal placements versus uh, instrumental placements. It's like most of my co-writing that I've done is with singers because that's not a strength of mine, but it's been a very small amount of my revenue. So it hasn't seemed that worthwhile. And even instrumental co-writes, it feels like I can start and finish stuff on my own so quickly that it's more profitable to just like a lot of the placements that I've had are 100% mine as opposed to ones that I co-wrote. Awesome. Uh, one little tag to that is that when I was first starting, I would tap on co-writers that I knew that were stronger in genres that I wasn't strong with. But then by doing those tracks, I could see under the hood of what elements were in there, and then I could do it myself later. I think we might have mentioned it in the intro here, but you received um, an award recently. I have it with me, actually. Oh, let's see it. Let's see it. Yeah. This Sing Titan Award, for me, really, it makes me feel really good. And it represents, like, all the years of dedication and hard work that I put into this. And that, like, I feel appreciated by you guys, you know, and, like, especially I've been working with Michael for a long time. And, like, his sort of mentorship is a big part of not just this award and all these placements, but all the revenue and how that improves my life and nice. makes me freed up to have more downtime and know that even if I take a week off, I still have royalty checks coming in. And stuff. I, I love Isha that you're talking about handing down the royalty stream. And as we wrap up, there's a great concept that uh, I think is worth sharing. And that is, you know, as parents, you guys are both parents have kids. Uh, I've got one on the way. So who knows, maybe by the time this is live, it'll actually be running or, or crawling around or laying around <laughs> crying, but, <laughs> but, but it uh, doesn't crawl that fast, but you know, you, you can't, you can't hand down a job to your heirs. Yeah. You know, you can hand down a business, you can hand down intellectual property. And when it comes to songs, you know, songs, I, I truly believe that they have value. I know that both of you guys believe the songs have value. Yeah. You know, everything that we do, no matter if we're walking through Home Depot looking for a two by four to build something with or, you know, the grocery store to go buy some milk, there's always music playing. There's always music surrounding us all the time. Right. Yeah. So music is really the soundtrack to our lives as it, people who create intellectual property. And, and you've hit on this a lot, Isha, is that you can hand that down. You can hand that royalty stream down to your heirs. And I think that's one of the most valuable aspects when you when you look at what you're creating, to look at it with the perspective of I'm not only just doing something that I love to do, but I'm really doing something for the longevity of my family. Isha, this has been an amazing conversation. Uh, you've provided so much insight for artists and composers and producers that are watching this. We appreciate you. We appreciate your time. And just keep kicking ass. You're you're killing it in the sync game. It's what we love to see. And uh, thanks again. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day. If you would like to join a thriving community of elite sync professionals dedicated to ensuring each other's success in sync licensing, then Elite Music Coaching invites you to join Sync Titan. That's right. And inside this community, you're going to have opportunities to connect directly with sync professionals like music supervisors, sync agents, and music library reps in our monthly virtual meetup and networking events. You're going to be able to get coaching directly from Jody and myself. We have listening sessions, and we also have meetups where you can connect with other collaborators all throughout the world. Also, we post opportunities for you to submit your music to films, TV shows, trailers, commercials, video games, podcasts, web series, and more. As a Sync Titan member, you're also eligible to receive a Sync Titan award. So make sure to click the link below or above or to the side or wherever it is on this channel so that you can learn more about Sync Titan and how you can become a valued member of this community.